Where are you if you travel second to the right, then straight on till morning? What? <laughs> okay, and how did a tipped over test tube in 1910 ensure you a safer crash in an auto accident today? Ah. Answers to those <laughs> and other questions coming up in this episode of The Off Ramp with Bob and Marsha Smith. Welcome to the off ramp, a chance to slow down, steer clear of crazy, take a side road to sanity, and get some perspective on life with fascinating facts and tantalizing trivia. <laughs> well, that describes your first question, Marsh. I don't oh, know what you're you. yes. laughing about there. So, okay, Bob, what famous place will you find if you traveled second to the right, then straight on till morning? Second to the right and straight on till morning. Where are you? That sounds like something out of an outer space movie or something. No. Second to the right and straight on till morning. Uh huh. Where do you wind up? <laughs> you got me. If you're Peter Pan, that's where you get Never Never Land. That's where it's located. <laughs> Peter Pan. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and I forgot it too. It's funny how you forget that. Yeah, that's the directions to get to Never Never Land. And that was the work of uh, James Matthew Barry. Yes. About the little boy who refused to grow up. Scottish <laughs> author. Yeah. Famous. Okay, well, that's great. All right, so now let's go to my question. Which is even greater, I'm It sure. is not even greater. <laughs> in 1910, a test tube tipped over in a lab. How did that ensure you of a safer crash in an auto accident? Well, somehow that led to uh, airbags. Did it release a force of some kind that the person who did it thought we could put that uh, inside of a balloon and it would eject up on impact? The test tube was tipped over in a laboratory accident, and it didn't break into pieces. It just cracked. And the reason was the tube had a film left inside of it from evaporation of a nitrocellulose mixture. That held the tube together, and that led to safety glass. Oh, safety glass. Yes. So it was French chemist Edouard Benedictus. He patented the idea in 1910, and in 1926, American Armory Haskell obtained the rights to the patent and started the Triplex Safety Glass Company of North America. And the first safety glass windshields, they were first installed as standard equipment on high-priced Stutz Bearcat motor cars. Oh. It was considered a luxury oh, item. Oh, you bet. Everything is in the beginning. Remember, only luxury cars had uh, airbags. And electric windows. Yeah. Remember now everybody, Now everybody's got the beeping and the maps and... When are they going to run out of ideas what the luxury cars will have that you don't? I Who don't knows? Know. Who knows? Who knows? Okay, you ready? Yeah. This is one you'll like. Okay. According to Guinness Book of World Records, Bob, who is the world's loudest musical band? I thought it was The Who. Am I right? Yeah. Oh, was it? Oh, good. How'd you know that? Well, it was either The Who or Led Zeppelin. Now, well, at least in... Uh, the 1970s, the, the Who, the rock band, blew out eardrums with a concert that reached 126 decibels and 76,000 watts. And I guess uh, Karma, so who has a tendonitis? Uh, what's his name? Is Pete Townsend. Pete Townsend, yeah, yeah. He's got that ringing in the ears, yeah, and it, it comes from all that. 126 decibels, and that's a decibel threshold that is equivalent to a jet engine taking off. Jeez, what was it again? So, uh, 126 decibels. Wow. Deep Purple had sound that reached 117 decibels before then, and three members of the audience fell unconscious. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, they were closer, apparently, to the stage than uh, some that's, others. That's interesting. Yes, well, yeah, how loud is enough? How loud is too loud? Yeah, well, that, obviously. Okay, I have another transportation question for you. Okay. How did the man who invented cash register motors help you start your car this morning? How did a fellow who invented cash... Cash register motors. Now, this is back in the time when cash registers were electromechanical, not electronic. So everything had a motor in it. Everything uh -huh. had movement. So obviously some mechanism in the cash register is now inside your car. Charles F. Kettering, who invented the electric motors used in cash registers, also invented the electric self-starting motors used in cars. Before that, cars had to be hand-cranked to get the motor to turn over. 
those cranks could be very dangerous. Okay. And the inspiration for that was the death of a friend of one of the big automakers. Cadillac's boss, Henry Leland, had uh, lost a good friend who was killed while trying to crank an auto engine. So he gave Kettering a contract to supply 4,000 self-starters to Cadillac. And Cadillac had the first. Okay. Again, like you said, uh, all of these features started out in very, very I primo cars. cars. Yeah. And the, uh, the first self-starting engine was a Cadillac. And Charles F. Kettering, his company was uh, called the Dayton Engineering Laboratories, known as Delco. We know that yeah, name now. Yeah. And then he eventually became head of, uh, of one of the major automakers, Charles Kettering. Okay. All right, Bob. There's a guy named Elias, and he was a carpenter and a furniture maker, and he helped build the famous White City of Chicago's World Fair. Mm -hmm. This is my last World's Fair Chicago question. I finished <laughs> the book, and I've moved on. <laughs> that was in 1893. Anyway, Elias was just tickled with the, the whole process and the magicalness of the whole event and how it looked and his part in it, and he talked about it for years. Okay, so Bob, who was Elias? Elias. Elias Disney. Walt Disney. Walt wasn't there. This is his dad. His dad? Yes. His and dad helped build the World's yeah. Fair in Chicago yeah. in 1893? Yeah. And he wasn't even born when he was building, but he never stopped talking about and talking to his family about it and telling stories about it. And his youngest son, Walt, was born afterwards, and one can't uh, but wonder if... Uh, it, Disney World and Disneyland might yeah. have been inspired in some way from yes. his father? Yeah. I had never thought of that. Yeah, especially the Magic Kingdom, right? And um, that's how his dad would talk about this place. We used the name Elias, and, and I, you only hear about that every once in a while, and I knew that was Walt Disney's middle name, so that was his dad's name. Yeah, huh. I didn't know that was his middle name, so you guessed that right. Jeez, okay, good for you, Bob. All right, Marcia. That's what I meant to say. Speaking of movies, these days we associate the word blockbuster with a big Hollywood film, usually released in the summer, right? Uh-huh. Something that dominates the box office. But what did blockbuster originally mean? Well, it's, uh, oh, was it a lumberjack and he was the first one to break the wood uh, down the middle? No, it's more recent than that. It's a World War II term. Okay. I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're pausing like I'm going to erupt with the answer. I'm sorry, dear, but no. Blockbuster is a World War II term dating back to 1942. A blockbuster was an 8,000-pound bomb big enough to destroy a city block. And the early post-war years, that term migrated to boxing. When he became heavyweight champion in 1952, Rocky Marciano was known as the Brockton Blockbuster. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. And then eventually the term migrated to the movies. Huh. So that's where it came from. Oh. It came from World War II and a bomb, a huge bomb, the Blockbuster. Oh, darn. Yeah, I, no. I had never heard of no. that. I just thought Blockbuster, it was a block of movies or a block of entertainment or it's a scheduling it, block or something. Yeah, what, Blockbusters, uh, of course. That's I never thought of that. Yeah, the same name thing, of that the, video the old store. video yeah. chain, the Blockbusters. I never put those two together till just this moment. How stupid am I? Well, I don't think that's a good question to ever, <laughs> ever okay. ask another person. You've been never. to the Statue of Liberty, haven't you? Yes, I, I have. The Statue of Liberty holds a gigantic tablet in her hand. What are the words written on that tablet? 1776 as the date, doesn't it? Yes. On, on it in Roman numerals. Yes. But what, what are the words? I don't know. It's, it's a date. Oh, it's, it is a date. Yeah. So I'm right. July 4th, 1776. That's it. July 4th, 1776. It's the only words written on the statue itself. On the pedestal is a, the great and famous poem by Emma Lazarus. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses. That, Yearning to breathe free. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's on a plaque mounted on the pedestal. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Marcia, there's a certain term we use today about a change, a moment of change. Pivot? Like pivot, but it's not pivot. Okay. And it originally had racist origins. What is the term? Ah, I don't know. Tipping point. Ah, yes. Tipping point. It describes the critical point when a change that had been a possibility now becomes inevitable. Okay. And when it was popularized, according to Merriam-Webster, it was applying to one phenomenon in particular, white flight for the suburbs. That's where that originally oh, came from in the 50s. As, really? As white people abandoned urban areas for the suburbs, journalists began using the phrase tipping point in relation to the percentage of minority neighbors it took to trigger that reaction among white city residents. It, now, that pr phrase wasn't coined in the 1950s. It first appeared in the 19th century, but it has racist origins in its first major use. I, I didn't know that. Huh. But people say, oh, that's the tipping point. Yeah. That's when things change. That comes from there. That's the origin. Okay. 
Easter Island. You know about that? It's home yes. to those giant hand-carved statues. The They're, stones, the heads, yes. Yes. They're called Moria, M-O-A-I. The, they were made around 700 to 800 CE, and they're 13 feet tall and 14 tons each. Wow. So here's my question. How many are there on Easter Island? Well, I think there are a lot more than they thought. I think they found the quarry uh, where they came from in another location, I believe, and they're a lot taller than they thought they were. They, well, you know, they're 13 feet tall. and tall. Well, from the ground, but you could dig down farther, and they're sculpted in, the shoulders are sculpted in I'm everything. not privy to that information. Well, according to my archaeological <laughs> sources. Okay, so the question was, how many are there? Um, yeah. 13? 1,000. Wow! Yeah. 14 tons each, Bob. Bigger than any of my creations. <laughs> well, honey, your your little claymation thing made with Play-Doh was, <laughs> was stunning. It looked cute. It was. Geez, isn't that amazing? And uh, yeah, there's still a lot of mystery about that. Oh, there's so much mystery of going way back. And to be off this, this island that's isolated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do they do that? Go ahead, Bob. You and I have often wondered about the sport of curling. It's like, is that really a sport? You know, we always look at that. But what town is the curling capital of America? I'll give you some choices. Missoula, Montana, Burlington, Vermont, Bemidji, Minnesota, or Traverse City, Michigan? Ah, Montana. No, it's uh, Bemidji, Minnesota. It is Bemidji. Okay. Yeah, they're the curling capital of America, and they have the medals to prove it, the Olympic medals. No kidding. Curlers from Bemidji won medals at both the 2006 and 2018 Winter Olympics. Located in northern Minnesota, the town is home to only about 15,000 people, but the Bemidji Curling Club has attracted thousands more when it hosts national championship competitions. I've been to Bemidji, haven't we? Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Very, very uh, woody up there, <laughs> woodsy, <laughs> and beautiful. Yes. Okay, my singing husband. What me, me, it, me, me. What is the rarest of all voice types? You are what, a baritone? Baritone or a bass. Okay. Yeah. What's the rarest? Yeah. Ah, uh, there is a voice that goes way up high in the registers. I don't know what it's called. The rarest voice type is a countertenor. It's a male singer who can sing as high as a soprano or a mezzo-soprano. Wow. It's the most rare of all the voices. So you, every so often you hear a guy who can really take it up to the top notches. That's called a countertenor. Never heard of that before. Hmm. Mm-mm. 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 Try, Bob. Go ahead. No. Oh! no. <laughs> Come on. You can do it. I can't get up there. <laughs> What is the oh, main source of the Mississippi River, Marcia? Another geography question is here. It from, you is mean, it Lake Superior? Uh-huh. Is it Lake Minnetonka? Is it Lake Itasca or Lake Vermilion? Uh, Superior. No. Of course not. No, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> I said it with such conviction. It's Lake Itasca. Okay. Although We're, the I... Mississippi flows 2,348 miles to the Gulf of Mexico and stretches 11 miles across at its highest width. Wow. It begins as a tiny stream stemming from northern Minnesota's Lake Itasca. It's a uh, 1.8 square mile glacial lake in Itasca State Park. What state is that? It's in Minnesota. Oh, okay. That's... Although the uh, the Mississippi actually starts out in Montana as the Missouri River. Yeah, and goes all the way to New Orleans. Yeah, it's amazing. Time to take a break. You're listening to The Off-Ramp with Bob. Bob and Marsha Smith. Don't just say your name. Marsha. Oh, never mind. Bob. We'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> I'm Bob. No, you're not. All right. Okay, we're back. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> okay, we're back. <laughs> Indeed. You're we're... listening to the podcast dedicated to insatiable curiosity oh God, and lifelong learning. All right. Isn't that okay? It's just too much. All right, I have a question for you. What gender was responsible for the first alcoholic beverages? Well, I have a feeling it's not the obvious, so I'll say women. It is women, and there's a really good explanation for that. For millennia, fermented drinks were considered food. I I never thought of that. Think of beer as liquid bread, Marcia. Okay. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Done. (laughs) Because beer was considered food, it was first made in homes by women. And women were the primary beer makers going all the way back to the ancient Sumerian civilization. And in the Code of Hammurabi, there are no male tavern owners or brewers. The text always refers to she. So women were known as... The brewers. They were were chefs, cooks, and brewers, too. I'll be danged. And even the Sumerian god of beer was a goddess. (laughs) The Sumerian god of beer? Yeah. 
And then apparently, for most of the next 2,000 years across the world, women brewed alcohol out of their homes using honey, grains, flowers, and herbs. Before the year 1500, most English women knew how to brew ale. Some women even started ale houses, hanging what they call ale stakes on their homes to indicate that a drink was available inside. But that backfired because when women began selling ale, writers and religious authorities began to criticize ale wives as cheats and temptresses. Uh Uh-oh, temptresses. And then uh, Uh after millions of people died in the plague, for some reason, brewing shifted to men and it became an industrialized, mass-produced product. I wonder why that is. Don't know, but apparently sake had a similar trajectory in Japan, made at first by women, later primarily by men. I have a few girlfriends who make their own beer. Okay. So the tradition continues. (laughs) Okay, Bob, can you give me an estimate of the population in the Arctic Circle? Uh, I would assume that is a small population. I'll say under a thousand people. That's a good guess. Okay. That's over four million. What? Yeah. Doesn't that blow your way? Uh, The Arctic Circle incorporates portions of eight countries, Canada, Greenland, Iceland, Norway, Finland, Russia, Sweden, and the United States. Mm. And despite the harsh climate and often in hospitable living conditions, there are still four million people who live and work there year-round. That's amazing. I didn't know there were that many. No. Or or that many countries had, you know, parts of their uh, territory in the Arctic Circle. And there's indigenous people. There are 40 different ethnic groups there. Uh, The Inuit, Sami, you pick peoples uh, that account for 10% of the regional population. Wow. And they maintain traditional culture like fishing, reindeer herding, and hunting activities. Oh, reindeer yeah. herding. I've got something that relates they've to been reindeer. There, they've been there for thousands of years and are still there. Okay, Marcia, speaking of reindeer, <laughs> <laughs> where does the word parka come from? Parka. Parka over here. Um Reindeer. Well, you said it has something to do with reindeer. I don't know. Parka comes from an Inuit word. You mentioned the Inuits, Mm -hmm. the Eskimos. But they got it from the Russians, who were the first people to settle Alaska from a European extraction, okay? Uh So when they came there, they had a word that they used. Parka was a word that meant skin coat. Animal skins. In what language? From a Russian native language. Oh, okay. Parka. And a lot of times it was reindeer coats. Oh, that makes sense. Reindeer pelts, you know, Mm -hmm. and they would pull them over. We think of a parka as something you pull over with a hood. Well, you'd pull them over your head, Uh and you had a nice winter coat. That was what parka was. But, of course, today we... It's usually a lighter jacket for winter. It says Land's End on it or <laughs> Yes, or, or Hetty Bauer or something <laughs> yeah. like that. Okay, well, that uh, makes sense, actually. And those look, when you see the old movies, you know, with Kevin Costner or whatever, and they're wearing these huge animal skins over their body, you think, well, that had to be warm. Think of how you survived the Think elements. of how they smelled yeah. <laughs> if they got wet or something, you know? Yeah, well, let's not. Okay, Bob, tell me, what is Air Horse One? What? <laughs> Air Horse One. Air Horse One? Yeah. So what is this, the president's plane for horses I haven't heard about? <laughs> Makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. But there is, not a presidential plane, but there is a plane dedicated for transporting horses called Air Horse One. <laughs> and it's owned and operated by Tex Sutton Equine Air Transportation. What? Air transportation. It's a Boeing 727-2000 cargo airlift used for racehorses, show horses, and other VIP clients. These, Because, you know, these 1,000-pound beauties have to travel somehow. Not all of them go in trailers. Yeah. And it's not cheap. Round trip, 10,000 bucks. And do they actually get a seat? Because horses don't usually sit down. You know, I don't know. And, well, <laughs> do they get free peanuts? That's the question. Oh, that is a question. Yeah, I don't know. This but, reminds me of that uh, story we did last year on the uh, how they got the horses to the Tokyo Olympics. And it was the same thing. They FedEx flew them in big... Wow, cargo ships. Cargo cargo planes. I imagine they had to anchor them down. And, oh, that must have been terrifying if you're a... Uh, horse, don't you think? Yeah, and they had stalls and everything, and, you know, but, I mean... Oh, did they? Yeah, they had people on board for each horse. To keep them calm. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Air Horse One. Yeah. I I like the name. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Air Air Horse One. Okay, I have a question for you. We were talking about coats and things like that. I'd like to be a stewardess on that. (laughs) Marcia, they're called flight attendants now. I'm sorry. I misspoke. Shame on you. (laughs) 
Go ahead. Okay, how did a near-death experience lead to light winter outerwear, the puffy coat? The quilted puffy coat we all know about. What was the first part of that question? How did a near-death experience lead to that? The person well, who invented it yeah. well, did, they, did it because they had a near-death experience. Well, did they fall down a mountain uh, skiing or something and, and it wasn't thick enough to bounce off the rock so they put air in the coat and no, you, judging from the terrible face you're making at me. Okay. <laughs> All right, tell me. Okay, now human beings have known that Goose Down had insulating properties for centuries, but it took a near-death experience, a new design, and a great marketing campaign to popularize the puffy quilted jackets we all know and love. And who can we say did that? Eddie Bauer. The, really? The real Eddie Bauer. Yeah. He was a hunter fisherman named Eddie Bauer. He ran a Seattle-based sporting goods shop. He uh, got hypothermia and nearly died during a 1936 steelhead fishing trip in the Pacific Northwest. And when he returned to Seattle, he remembered stories that his Russian uncle told him about the downfilled winter coats that Russian soldiers used to wear in the Russo-Japanese War back in 1905. So he designed a lightweight downfilled jacket with those diamond-shaped quilted yeah. compartments so that kept the down from falling to the bottom of the jacket. And he called it the Skyliner, and he patented it in 1940, just in time for World War II. <laughs> so he began adv advertising it in Field and Stream, American Rifleman, and all those magazines. And then World War II, the government contracted with Eddie Bauer to make flight suits and sleeping bags wow. for U.S. service people. He made a fortune and, and a useful product. The B-9 flight suit, down insulation flying jacket with downfilled pants designed to keep aviators warm for up to three days in minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures. Anyway, each one of those jackets that he made for the U.S. government had a tag inside said Eddie Bauer, Seattle, USA, which gave him a brand name and future customer basis I'll with bet. the XGIs after the war. Good marketing. They still uh, they still sell that model, the 1936 Skyliner model down jacket, still available through the uh, Eddie Bauer Originals line. Interesting. Yes, it is. That's how it happened. Okay, Bob, what percentage of objects in its collection does the Smithsonian, that's named after you, I think, Smithsonian <laughs> Institute exhibit? How much of their exhibit do oh, they... They're probably like most museums that they only show maybe 25% of what they have because no, good... they keep it all in warehouses yeah. and they keep circulating. Yeah. And I'll say 20% of their collection is on view at any given time. Oh, that's a good guess. But you'd be surprised to know it's less than 1%. Wow. Isn't that something? There are 155 million objects in the Smithsonian collections and at any one time, they can only show less than 1%. Oh, my God. And you know how big those buildings are and how many there are. Yes. So, uh, And look, it takes days to go through each one. You think they'll want the, our off-ramp sign? I don't think so. Oh, okay. But you talked about the Smithsonian Institution? Yes. Okay. Well, what famous American inventors were snubbed by the Smithsonian? Oh. And as a result, the Science Museum of London acquired their invention for display. These were famous Inventors. Uh huh. The Smithsonian said, "No, no, we're not interested." Uh, I don't know. The Wright brothers. Oh come on! This is a, they didn't take the Wright brothers. Isn't that interesting? Now most people our age and younger wouldn't know about that because it happened before we were born. But the Smithsonian <laughs> would not acknowledge that the Wrights had built the first man-made heavier-than-air machine capable of powered flight because they had sponsored another aviator. Oh. So the Wrights, they sent their first airplane to the Science Museum of London, where it remained until the Smithsonian admitted its mistake and offered to house the craft. And that's how they got it back. Such pomposity. It is, uh, really. And isn't that amazing that they wouldn't do that? They wouldn't say, no, we were wrong. Uh, well, give yeah. us your plane. <laughs> no, they finally did that. Well, that is stupid. And it has no foresight to do that. It's just doesn't say much about the Smithsonian uh, management at the time, at the does time. it? No. Yeah. Well, All right. So here's some useless things you should know. Oh, good. Like how many punctuation marks do you think are in the English language? Take a guess. Quick, quick. How many? I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, 20. 14. Oh, really? Well, I was close. See? Yes. See, I was close. How, how heavy is the world's largest pastry, Bob? What? 
I, how heavy is the wood? It'd be a cake, right? Or are we talking? It says pastry. Okay, 200 pounds. 660. Jeez, I'm just not doing well on this category, and am I? last one, how many? <laughs> Jeez, thank God. <laughs> These are things you should know. Okay. And lastly, how many beaches are there in Israel? Israel's got a great tourist industry, so I would say there's probably maybe 50. Really? Yeah. No, there are 137 beaches. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. I that's had... a small strip of land to have how many? 137. 137 beaches. Jeez. Political. Uh-huh. Political question. Lyndon Johnson, he was a flamboyant campaigner. Yes. Even when he was running for Congress, he had a habit of tossing his big Stetson hat out into the crowds at political rallies, but he always got it back. How? Was there a string on it? Nope. He always paid a little boy a dollar in advance to retrieve it. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. The hat itself was worth $25, and he didn't want to lose it. So. Well, and besides, cowboy hats... Uh, mean a lot to uh, Southern people or cowboys or pretend cowboys, whatever, but hats are very special to Well, them. they're very personal things. And, you know, it was like a trademark for him to have this big Stetson hat. So uh -huh. I want to get my hat back. So I want my Stetson. Hired a little boy to always go out there, and he'd probably have to beg some people to give it back to him. Yeah. You know, And they probably thought, oh, he's a cute little boy. You can have the hat. Yeah. <laughs> then he goes back to Lyndon and gives it to him. I'll be darn. Okay, education question now. Okay. Who is the only U.S. president who had a Ph.D.? Okay, let me guess. Let me guess. Was probably was he not one of our best presidents? Well, I think it's controversial. He was a. Oh, was it Woodrow a, Wilson? Woodrow Wilson, yeah, Woodrow Wilson, who saw America through World War One oh. and had the idea for the League of Nations, oh. which was basically the idea that became the United Nations thirty years later. Okay, Bob, I'm going to finish up with a quote today from. Dolly Parton, who is now in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yes, yes. Okay, and she says, the way I see it, if you want the rainbow, you got to put up with the rain. All right. <laughs> All right, well, that's it for this week. We hope you've enjoyed our uh, little bit of trivia and knowledge, uh, and we are dedicated to lifelong learning. Oh, geez, please. Well, what's the matter? Nothing, dear. Well, how long have you lived? It's been a long life so far. Sure. Well, and you've been learning all that time. Yes. So it's lifelong learning. Okay. You're an example of lifelong learning, Marcia. I'm an exampler. I like that. Let's move on. I'm Bob Smith. I'm Marcia Smith. Join us again when we return next week with more tantalizing trivia <laughs> and fascinating facts <laughs> on The, the Off-Ramp. Ramp. Too much? Yeah. <laughs> okay, too much. Okay. The Off-Ramp is produced in association with CPL Radio Online and the Cedarbrook Public Library. Cedarburg, Wisconsin.